The California Pioneers of Santa Clara County are a nonprofit organization founded in 1875 to preserve and promote the history of the Valley of Heart's Delight, a region more commonly known today as Silicon Valley. One of the ways we preserve the Valley's history is through our film preservation program. In early 2015, we received a contribution of vintage family films, which totally amazed us. Inside a large cardboard box, amongst many wonderful films of local interest, were 11 reels tucked neatly inside a repurposed gallon can, an iconic holdover from the Valley's fruit canning operations. The film canisters were simply labeled Malolo. We searched the internet and discovered this reference was the steamship Malolo, the first modern ocean liner specifically designed for luxurious leisure cruising. We were mesmerized by these rare moving images captured by a passenger while on the ship's first round-the-Pacific cruise in 1929. As historians, we wanted to know more, and with a little effort, we discovered a copy of the ship's manifest. It disclosed the names of the 356 passengers on board. Using online genealogical websites, this list became our roadmap that led directly to many of the passengers' living descendants. We dedicate this documentary to those families who thoughtfully preserved the many journals, photos, and narratives from this historic trip, then shared them so we may accurately revisit this amazing moment in history. In 1910, the 146 passenger ship SS Wilhelmina was the pride of the Pacific, and she rivaled the finest passenger ships serving the Atlantic routes. She was only one of a growing number of ships operated by Captain William Matson, president and founder of Matson Navigation Company, whose primary interest was the transfer of freight between the Pacific Coast and the Hawaiian Islands. At this time, passenger service was perceived to be not all that different than their freight business. Cargo picked up at point A and safely transported to point B. Then, in 1925, the Territorial Hotel Company of Hawaii announced the construction of a new $5 million luxury hotel, far from the two antiquated hotels situated in downtown Honolulu. The new hotel would be constructed on a 15-acre site on a little-known pristine beach called Waikiki. The new hotel will be crowned the Royal Hawaiian. From this day forward, Passengers will no longer be viewed as cargo, but as tourists with money. In order to fill the hotel's 400 rooms, Matson commissions the construction of a new luxury passenger liner. The ship is christened the SS Malolo, a Hawaiian word meaning flying fish. Plans call for the Malolo to match or exceed the elegance of the new hotel. Constructed in Philadelphia, the ship is 582 feet long with seven decks connected by elevators. No other ship afloat could match the Malolo's comfortable amenities. Not only was she one of the most luxurious ships known to man, she was also the fastest. In 1927, Matson's leadership comes under the control of Matson's son-in-law, 48-year-old William Philip Roth. The world was a much larger place, and Roth conceives of the Malolo being utilized as a floating grand hotel, opening up more primitive and exotic ports of call. Roth collaborates with the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce to create a first-of-its-kind luxury tour of the Pacific, selecting Charles C. Moore to be their cruise director. The upward price for a double room with private bath is set at $4,700 per person, double occupancy. The first to guarantee their place on board is James Coffroth of San Diego, reserving the ship's luxury suite for a modest $12,000. This is 1929, and American labor is producing 46% of the world's industrial goods. 
ranking America first in worldwide exports. Even so, the average worker earns $750 a year, with college professionals averaging higher at $3,000. Despite these seeming disparities, the tour is an instant sellout. Their itinerary calls for a 90-day, 24,000-mile odyssey around the Pacific, calling on 19 ports in 14 countries. Although officially titled as the Around Pacific Cruise of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, journalists quickly dub it the Millionaire's Cruise. <laughs> Ashore. We're off at 1210 amidst a din of whistles, army airplanes, cruisers, fireboats throwing water, and much waving of flags and handkerchiefs. In our staterooms, we found lots of presents and telegrams. It smelled like Finley's funeral parlor on a court of so many flowers. Floyd Averill Sr., Portland, Oregon. The ship's captain is Charles A. Bernstein of Oakland, California, who will one day become the Commodore of Matson's entire fleet of ships. The company in contract to provide tour services is the American Express Corporation of New York City, headed up by Lewis Stone. I had dinner at my regular time, but my family preferred to pass it up. Quite a stiff blow outside the gate, and while the wife and kids were not actually sick, they were close to it. Only about 20% of the passengers actually showed up to eat. Should anyone have an actual medical emergency, the ship's surgeon is Dr. Leo Stanley. Although he's dressed in an officer's uniform, he's actually the chief surgeon at California's notorious San Quentin State Prison. He will perform many plastic surgeries based on his theory inmates might reform their criminal ways if their physical image improved. Dr. Stanley's personal views on eugenics, especially his surgical practices relating to masculine virility, will one day come under serious dispute by the scientific community. During World War II, Dr. Stanley will once again find himself back in the Pacific, this time tending to the needs of wounded soldiers during his four years of service in the Naval Reserves. Dr. Stanley will pass away at age 90, never having any children of his own. After enduring 11 days in rough seas, the Malolo and her passengers finally arrive at their first port of call, Yokohama, Japan. The ship drops anchor outside the breakwater in order to allow quarantine and custom agents to come aboard. As passengers waited for their turn to go ashore, they were treated to Polynesian melodies from the Malolo's musical quartet, Sam Alama and his Hawaiians. In 1923, the city of Yokohama was laid low by an enormous earthquake. On August 31st of that year, it was a great cosmopolitan seaport of a half a million people. By September 1st, it was a vast field of hot embers, heaps of brick and twisted iron, and more than 100,000 dead bodies. Despite significant reconstruction over the past six years, there are still thousands of temporary wooden structures as the city struggles to rebuild. Nara was the imperial capital of Japan from the year 710 to 794 AD. At the noon hour, an old man blows a bugle at the sound of which a large number of deer come running down a hill from all directions to the front of a large building where people come to feed them. Ethel Baldwin, Maui, Hawaii. While visiting Tokyo, one of the wealthier passengers decided to purchase 50 barrels of goldfish and had them placed in his stateroom. They soon became sick and appeared to be malnourished. They would not eat anything that was fed to them, including several attempts to feed them expensive caviar. It didn't take long before all of the fish died 
and the passenger's entire investment was unceremoniously thrown overboard. The oldest passenger on board is 82-year-old Charles Henry Hyde, founder and president of West Coast Grocery Company of Tacoma, Washington. The ship's youngest passengers are Andre Summers, age eight, and her nine-year-old brother, Arthur Summers, Jr. They are the children of 12-term Congressman Andrew Summers of Brooklyn, New York, who was unable to make the journey. In place of their parents, the children are accompanied on the cruise by their paternal grandfather, Arthur Summers Sr., president of New York City's Board of Education. This will not be Arthur Jr.'s last trip to the South Pacific. Arthur will enlist in the United States Marine Corps, proudly serving his country as a dive bomber pilot. His flight squadron, the 243, known as the Flying Gold Bricks, will be based at Amunda in the Solomon Islands. Before the war is over, this often overlooked nine-year-old passenger will earn multiple air medals, including the Distinguished Flying Cross. I think I got the biggest thrill of the whole trip when I first saw the coast of China. I found myself humming, on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fish play and the dawns come up like thunder out of China across the bay. Anchored in the Bay of Chinwengdao, a harbor tender transported the Malolo's passengers to a special 16-car train chartered by the American Express Company. Their only layover on their way to Peking was at the city of Tianjin where they were greeted by a number of American Army officers from the 15th Infantry Regiment. The American Military Regiment had been garrisoned at Tianjin since the Boxer Rebellion 30 years earlier. Some of the passengers took advantage of the rest stop to take rickshaw rides throughout the city. Passenger James Irvine, a major landowner from Southern California, took this occasion to send a postcard home to Mr. Paul Schuf, an executive for the Southern Pacific Railroad in San Francisco. My dear Paul, I learned in Peking, China, how to run a railroad seven years without putting any money into upkeep. <laughs> you should try it. Your friend, James Irvine. Five hours later, we finally arrived at the Peking train station. This was a very large city where men competed with mules and camels, each moving in synchronous rhythm through the city's noisy streets. Soon after we left Tencent, we were told that war had been declared between North and South China and that our train would be the last one in and out of Peking. We heard it said this war had actually been placed on hold, waiting for our arrival in Peking. It seems our train will assist in the removal of Westerners who are escaping inland cities and seeking safe refuge in Shanghai. It's here we encountered our first really filthy, dirty, crippled beggars. I'll admit, many of us felt ill at ease, as times are so uncertain in China these days. The Chinese are great for congregating and living in crowds. The rickshaw men often sleep in the rickshaws, as they have no homes and eat at the sidewalk cooking places. Every city has its own particular smell, and we all rode around with handkerchiefs to our noses. In the heart of this imperial city stands the famous and once exclusive Forbidden City of China. But no funds have been available to maintain its former splendor, and many of the temples are being turned into schools or offices or outright being demolished. 
many are dropping to pieces from neglect. During our three days in Peking, we visited the famous Forbidden City, the Lama Temple, and the Temple of Confucius. We saw the summer and winter palaces of the Empress of China. Within the Winter Palace grounds was a pagoda-like temple where we saw a very famous white jade Buddha in the shape of a woman, life-size and sitting cross-legged on an altar. 200 years ago, this was a present from Burma. Draped across her shoulder is a gold lacquered mantle which contains many real diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. Nearby, we saw a marble boat anchored near the shore of a large artificial lake. Well, my impressions of Peking are walls, filth, dirt, smells, excited people screeching and yelling for no apparent reason, cruelty, beggars, neglect, no order about anything, and great uneducated masses everywhere. As you can see, I did not like Peking. Among the passengers from Portland, Oregon, were 52-year-old Charles Wright, his wife Georgia, and the couple's 15-year-old son, Arthur Frederick Wright. Peking was still a landscape untouched by the Western world. By being there, Arthur bore witness to the dying remnants of Marco Polo's Silk Road. The two days Arthur will spend in China and the indelible images he bore witness to must surely have been a seminal moment in this young man's life. Within the next eight years, Arthur will earn multiple bachelor degrees, one in modern Chinese history from Stanford University and another in literature from Oxford. In July of 1940, Arthur marries fellow student, Mary Oliver Claybaugh. While studying in China in the spring of 1943, Japanese authorities place them under arrest as enemy aliens and are sent immediately to Wexian, a prison camp located in Shandong, China. Here, they will endure 826 days of hardship and separation until American forces liberate the camp in September 1945. This wide-eyed 15-year-old passenger will ultimately accept a full professorship at Yale University and be named the first recipient of the Charles Seymour Professor of History, a position he will hold until his death in 1976. While passengers explore the Chinese mainland, Captain Bernson grants permission for a few of the officers to use the ship's motorboat to explore the area where the Great Wall of China enters the sea. The entire adventure, or perhaps misadventure, was recorded by Dr. Leo Stanley. Leading the expedition were Chief Steward Ernest Bikendi and Chief Engineer Louis Dwyer. Our course led northward and the motor worked very well. There was a good seat all the time and the waves dashed over the bow. After motoring for a little more than an hour, the crew cautiously turned toward the beach, where the Great Wall extends out into the sea. It was at this time the boat became stranded on top of a hidden sandbar. Fortunately, the water was quite shallow, and Dr. Stanley and Assistant Engineer Kennedy wasted no time wading onto the beach. Kennedy and I started out to see the wall. The rest of the men seemed to be in no hurry to come along as they were busy eating sandwiches and drinking beer. There indeed stood the Great Wall, built over 200 years before Christ, extending inland over mountain and valley for 1,500 miles. Spying a Chinese farmhouse, Kennedy and I descended upon the wall and made for it. We peered into the compound and a little Chinese girl saw us who ran screaming into the house. 
We saw four Chinese soldiers sitting in a circle and eating something. They were surprised to see us, but did not object to being photographed. Having traveled a distance of some four miles, the two men reluctantly returned to the beach. It is there they discover the boat is still hopelessly stranded and his fellow officers patiently waiting for the next high tide. Meanwhile, there was a great concern on board the Malola when the motorboat and her crew failed to return by five o'clock. Speculation ran high as to what may have happened to the missing crewman. Captain Burnson radioed a British cruiser to be on the lookout and he sent one of his officers to search for them along the coast in the powerful Chinese tugboat, the Fu Ping. We awakened at daybreak and the weather was quite cold. Unfortunately, the boat was still high and dry on a sand reef. While waiting for a higher tide to return, the rest of the crew set out to explore the countryside as well. They returned to the motorboat about dark, accompanied by 15 Italian soldiers from a nearby Italian garrison. The soldiers were willing boys and although they could speak no English, and we any Italian, still we all worked together as hard as we could. The engine was repaired and started. At the right moment it was reversed with full speed astern and then everyone lifted and strained, but it was still without a veil. We stayed overnight in the Italian garrison and had a wonderful dinner hosted by Commander Larno and his fiancée, Miss Favari. The next morning we all returned to the motorboat for yet another unsuccessful day of liberating the motorboat from a resting place. Unfortunately, even the Fu Ping's arrival on the scene did little to free the motorboat from the sandbar. Finally, the tugboat set off for the Malolo with the ship's maroon seamen. They were a sorry sight as they finally came alongside the Malolo at two o'clock in the morning. Never did a hot shower and fine clean bed feel better than it did that night. Oh boy, what a grand and glorious feeling. The Fu Ping and her determined crew then returned to the stranded motorboat to try again when the tide was higher. At about noon, I looked through my field glasses and I saw the Fu Ping headed away from the beach with the stranded boat in tow. They came alongside about three o'clock and the power boat was lifted up on its davits, where it will probably remain for a long time to come. The word Shanghai comes from two Chinese words meaning approaching the sea. Practically all of the large ports of China were securely established a few miles inland along a river, and Shanghai was no exception. While in Shanghai, Dr. Stanley returned to the Malolo one evening and was informed of a female passenger having need of his medical attention. She had been complaining about severe pains in her abdomen and a miscarriage was suspected. She confessed that she had been at a hotel in Shanghai when she first took sick, but rejected the idea of going to a hospital to be treated. After preparing the operating room for his patient, Dr. Stanley returned to her cabin, where she revealed to him she had a very severe cramp just 10 minutes before and that the whole mass had come away. She said she put it in a candy box and simply threw it out the porthole. A considerable mental load was taken off my mind as well as the patient's. The only thing to do now was to prevent excessive bleeding and to keep her quiet. The Malolo was scheduled to leave Shanghai at 10 in the morning. The tide was ebbing quickly. The wharves were covered with itinerant merchants who had their wares piled deep for sale to the tourists. On the dock were many performers, acrobats, jugglers, dog and monkey shows, even trained mice. They would all go through their performances, all for some bits of coin. There were all sorts of beggars pleading with passengers to throw money down to them from the deck above. As Shanghai money would be of no value in other ports, the passengers threw down all that they had left. Whenever a coin was thrown down, there was a great scramble. Boys, men, beggars, and cripples, all struggling for the money. We ferried from Kowloon to 
Hong Kong in the evening for nine cents. Nell McCarthy, Los Gatos, California. I was hoping to buy more Chinese dolls, but instead saw the poor coolies lying asleep on the sidewalk. Nothing wakes them as they are so tired from their rickshaws and sedan chairs all day long. The next day was warm, and we went to Repulse Bay for lunch, and the place was the grandest I have ever seen. Quail on toast, a pint of Chablis, braised celery, and a wonderful dessert, all for $2 gold. The view of Hong Kong from our boat in the daytime is wonderful. The view of the harbor at night is one never to be forgotten. I wouldn't mind living here. With an income of $100 a month gold, one could live like a plutocrat. The Philippines were discovered and named by the Spanish navigator Magellan in 1521 while on his circumnavigation of the globe. It was a voyage he did not complete, as he was killed here, not far from where he landed. The American Express arranged for passengers to witness retreat at Bilibid Prison. With 3,000 inmates, it's one of the largest penal institutions in the world. Every afternoon at 4.30, the prisoners are reviewed and put through exercise drills to the accompaniment of the prison band. as we cleared the island of Corregidor. The radio room lit up like a Christmas tree. It's true what they say about the speed at which bad news travels, and equally amazing how few words it will take in a telegram. As news of the stock market crash spread throughout the ship, passengers huddled together and gossiped about billions of dollars being lost overnight. Others remained silent and simply shook their heads in disbelief. Phrases like Black Tuesday were bandied about while others spoke more optimistically about a rosier tomorrow. But out here on the eastern fringes of the South China Sea, Tuesday was already Wednesday, and everyone seemed to be instinctively knowing there would be many dark days ahead of them. It has been said many long-lasting friendships were created between passengers during this cruise, but this was the actual date those relationships were formed. We steamed slowly up the winding Saigon River for about two hours, with thick vegetation on both banks. As we came closer to this French colonial city, the vegetation transformed into one large rice paddy. Such a little Paris, and so lovely with its avenue of trees and sidewalk cafes. It's just like Paris, but with the coolies, of course, which make it even nicer. We are all reluctant to leave this adorable city with its magnificent setting. I hope I can return someday. Malolo anchored 16 miles off the coast in shallow, muddy waters. Passengers ferried across the Pukham where we rode the special train into Bangkok. Thailand is a Buddhist country, and there are a great number of exquisite temples called Wat throughout Bangkok. They alone make a visit to Thailand worthwhile. The Malolo's passengers wandered throughout the various Wats all afternoon until they grew tired and all of the temples began to look alike. Many of the tired passengers went to the Fia Palace Hotel for afternoon tea, where they were entertained by the king's own Siamese dancers. We went to a snake farm and saw them take poison out of the most dangerous snakes in the world. This 
is so they can make a serum for the Pasteur Institute. Singapore is at the crossroads of the world. Ships of every flag and of every type will be found in its harbors. The Sultan's palace in Johor was very beautiful, and we saw monkeys in the trees. There is a mixture of people in the city. It's really poured a lot of rain now, and I have a cold. They have very lovely stores here and such a beautiful countryside. But oh, 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 it's hot, hot. At 10.30 on this bright, hot morning, Neptune and his staff came aboard out of the booby hatch on the forward deck, and they marched around the prom that day. All of the passengers had assembled so they might see the ceremonies. When King Neptune returned from his walk about the ship, he came to the ship's officers, who were lined up along the rail on the forward deck, and again demanded that the ship be turned over to them. This being granted by the captain, they proceeded to a platform just forward of the bridge, and there they held court. Those whose names were called responded, some of them with reluctance, but others came willingly. They were tried before the court and invariably found guilty. The sentence was to be dunked in a specially prepared tank. For the fulfillment of their sentence, each initiate was generously lathered for a mock shaving and shampoo. The first candidate was Gaylord Wilcox of Honolulu, who was dunked ungracefully into the tank. Next was James Sheehy of Portland. Mrs. Crystal Clapp from Alabama was the first lady to accept her medicine, and she did so with gusto. Perhaps 50 passengers in all were inducted. The court consisted of advertising executive George W. Kleiser of San Francisco as King Neptune. Russell Wagner from Los Angeles as Pollyanna. Mother Carey's chickens portrayed by Stanford University's famed quarterback, Chet Murphy. And Floyd Averill of Portland, that's Neptune's slave. It caused quite a lot of fun and excitement. At lunchtime, certificates were presented to all, stating that they had crossed the equator and that they were free forevermore from further molestation from Neptune in this crowd. Java is the crown jewel of the Dutch East Indies, with Batavia as the capital of Holland's colonial outpost here in Southeast Asia. One day, we will refer to this very same geography as Jakarta, Indonesia. We took an airplane ride around the city. We went way up into the clouds, around 10,000 feet, and rode around for about an hour or so. There are many muddy rivers and canals here, and they're all filled with snakes and crocodiles. It was very beautiful. We arrived at 8 o'clock and took sightseeing trips. It is truly one big garden, and the people here are so different from the rest of the trip. The next morning, we visited a fine zoological museum and a tea factory. There are beautiful poinsettias all along the river, where women wash their clothes while their kitties play around them. Gee, sometimes I get so homesick. Anyway, everyone from the boat was invited to a dance at the Hollander Hotel, so we wound up there to say our goodbyes to all the good people we met here. It is still very hot, but not so hot as it was a few days ago. I thought it was going to die from the heat as we crossed the hottest place along the equator. Everybody had a good time in Batavia, and we really hated to leave. Dockside greetings for the Malolo drew huge crowds all throughout Australia. Each port appeared to be competing for bragging rights as best host city. 
Passengers rode the Zephyr Ferry to Perth, where they were greeted at the Barrack Street jetty by Lord Mayor J.T. Franklin in all his majestic regalia. The band lined up in front of us and played the Star Spangled Banner. Then God saved the King. The Lord Mayor then delivered a short address of welcome which was true and sincere. He was answered by Mr. Charles Moore who spoke in the same sympathetic vein. Everybody in Melbourne must have turned out to welcome us. Schools were let out so children could see the Americans. After touring the city for an hour, many of the ship's Catholics traveled to Rahim, where they were greeted by the most reverent Dr. Mannix, the Archbishop of Melbourne. Some passengers traveled into the Yara countryside, arriving at the Karami Guest House in Marysville. while still others traveled to the Kitchener House in Marylands. Melbourne has definitely staked her claim to be the finest city on the continent. The fame of Sydney's harbor is known to every mariner, for it has no equal for size and beauty, with a shoreline hundreds of miles long. The city itself is situated all around the shoreline, and the harbor is crisscrossed by a fleet of regular steam launches connecting points of interest. The Malolo glided majestically into her berth at the number four wharf, West Circular Quay, just underneath the partially constructed harbor bridge. As passengers stepped onto the dock, they were greeted by the likes of Sweet Annie Pickles, a chewing gum street vendor. The procession of motor cars first went up Pitt Street, out to the Central Station, and then back out by way of Macquarie Street to the Government House. There was a reception by Mr. Dudley De Chair, the Governor of New South Wales. He had a delightful personality, calm, gentle, and gracious. Our next objective was Bondi Beach, one of the many watering places of Sydney. The season had just opened and there were many people in the water. The beach was long and crescent-shaped with a broad surf line. A life-saving exhibition was given for the benefit of our passengers by the Bondi Surf Club, headed by Tom Maher. Returning to the Malolo from a day of touring, I was handed a copy of a local newspaper. Its headline read, Malolo brings grave scourge to Sydney. The story went on to cite grim allegations of shocking, ill treatment towards the crew, including claims of being fed reconstituted table scraps from passengers' plates. All in all, there were 29 recorded cases of sexually transmitted diseases among the crewmen, including one fatality. On November 12th, the patient began to act irrational. He developed rapid breathing and his heart action could scarcely be heard. On November 21st, he was transferred to a Melbourne hospital where he was pronounced dead two days later. It is a very long distance from Australia to New Zealand and crossing the Tasman Sea was very rough. Everything fell off the table. Rudyard Kipling often described Auckland, New Zealand as the last, loneliest, loveliest city of the British Empire. The country's two major islands stretch north and south, nearly a thousand miles, and the climate and scenery will vary as widely as in South America. In 1929, New Zealand is populated by less than as many people as live in Brooklyn, New York, although the area is considerably greater than the British Isles. Nearly all of the passengers opted for the one-day tour to Rotorua, and by 8 o'clock, 
they were coming off the gangways and climbing into the American Express chartered train cars. Passengers were assigned to one of the many large awaiting automobiles which drove the few remaining miles to the top gate which entered into the small village called Fakarawarawa. Groups of six were assigned their own Maori guide dressed in a long rustling pew pew, a flaxen skirt worn over a red underskirt. Inside the village enclosure, hundreds of tourists came face to face with hundreds of natives. Among the pretty native women was a young Anahato. The passengers heard her sing the popular tune, Pokare Kariana, a haunting Maori melody that will soon become the country's unofficial national anthem. Naked children frolicked in the cooler pools where they danced to haka for a penny, which they stowed away in their bulging cheeks for safekeeping. As the tourists moved along, the guides explained the carvings on the meeting house and pointed out cooking pots in the bubbling mud pools before entering Faka village. Eventually, the Malolo's passengers arrived safely back on board that evening, happy but exhausted, each brimming with a treasury of stories eager to be retold. Mr. James Coffroth secured over 100 passes to the horse races this afternoon at Takapuna Jockey Club across from the harbor. Kofroth had created his own racetrack and casino just across the Mexican border in Tijuana, Mexico. He called it the Tijuana Jockey Club, and it had been a popular tourist destination throughout the 1920s. It was always a favorite spot for the Hollywood crowd, and San Diegans by the thousands would cross the border on Saturdays and Sundays to have a drink, watch and bet the races, and perhaps a slight chance to rub shoulders with a celebrity. The Fiji Islands are under the mandate of Australia. Nearly 250 islands compose the group, but only 80 are inhabited. Even though we arrived a day early, the locals were able to quickly put together a native dance for us. The pride of the Fijian is his hair. The natives train their hair to stand erect by mixing pulverized coral mixed with water to form a solution of lime. This lime pomade turns their hair a yellowish red. Some look almost purple. It does seem strange having two Saturdays in a row to catch up with the world. Later, the local constabulary band played music while we climbed back on board ship and departed. Pongo Pongo is the name of the American naval base on the island of Tutuia, a part of the Samoan group. The tall volcanic peak which dominates the skyline is called Rainmaker. About 30 Samoans came out to greet us in a boat. Men, women, and children came on board and sang hymns, and they reminded me of our own Hawaiian church choirs. Although the men's voices were excellent, the women's were far inferior to our own. We arrived at noon. Of all the places, this dear little tropic harbor is quite grand. 
It's no wonder Robert Louis Stevenson died here. It's a place you dream of, but never expect to see. Eia ta pupu, ta pupu inu inu e. A large crowd was on the wharf to greet us with lays. We were taken by autos to various popular points of interest, like Rainbow Falls, the Onomea Arch, and a variety of dormant volcanoes. After a fine lunch at the Volcano House, we were entertained with ancient Hawaiian songs and dances by Mrs. Helen Deshay Beamer and her family, consisting of herself, her sweet old mother, two daughters, and a little granddaughter. Never underestimate the future contributions of a six-year-old. Born Winona Kapua, Ilohia Manono Kalani Deshay Beamer, Everyone will soon come to know and love her simply as Auntie Nona. Much of her early life was spent on the island of Hawaii. Under the guidance of her grandmother, Auntie Nona began her study of the ancient art of the hula at the age of three. Before long, she was composing her own meles, melodies added to ancient Hawaiian chants. One of her meles is being played now by her son, Keola Beamer. Her Hawaiian heritage will gain her acceptance into the prestigious Kamehameha School, an institution whose reputation at the time was geared heavily on academics, but with very little attention paid to the preservation of her culture. By the time she turns 14, Auntie Nona will be expelled from this same school for teaching variations of the standing hula to her classmates dances which had been handed down to her by her grandmother. The irony will not go unnoticed in 1949 when she becomes an instructor of Hawaiian culture at Kamehameha School and will serve in that position for almost 40 years. Not only will Auntie Nona have a critical influence in reviving the art of the ancient Hawaiian dance, she will also be held in high esteem for her preservation of Hawaiian storytelling, music, and other native Hawaiian arts. The day went by very fast as we soon found ourselves back at the boat and saying our alohas to the big island. We said our goodbyes to our friends, many we have become very fond of. Some of the farewells were close and touching. It is here we ended our 24,000-mile journey. The band was on the wharf in Honolulu to meet us and a crowd we were very proud of. Hawaii was the end of the tour for many of the passengers who lived in the islands. The Baldwins, the Athertons, the Guards, the Robinsons and Wilcox families were among the many travelers who called Hawaii their home. It is a beautiful island. We took a drive to the Pauli and Diamond Head. Then we had lunch at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. We went for a drive and had lunch at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Never did I see such a hotel in such a setting. It's perfect in every way. Pink stucco with a blue roof and right on the beach. The gardens are the most exquisite in every way. I've never seen anything finer. I went bathing at the Waikiki beach where they ride the surf on boards. One local family who also bid their farewell alohas was Dr. Orman Wall, his wife Julia, and her 17-year-old daughter Eva Grossman. Dr. Wall, a practicing dentist in Honolulu, also held the patent for the automated windshield wiper system for automobiles. 
His wife, Julia, received income of her own from her father's Chicago-based company that supplied heavy equipment to Illinois railroads. Despite the onset of America's Greatest Depression, the walls marked the occasion to initiate groundbreaking for a large family summer home. The location they selected was along a pristine sandy beach nestled between Waimanalo and Makapu'u Point on the windward side of Oahu. Locals still refer to this three-acre parcel as Pohonu, the Hawaiian term for sea turtle enclosure, named for the ancient pond adjacent to their home where turtles were once raised for the pleasure of Hawaii's royalty. The home will remain within the family for 82 years, during which time it becomes recognizable worldwide as Robin's Nest, the magnificent beachfront estate of the fictitious Robin Masters on the television series Magnum P.I. The trip home was unbearably slow, especially for the real estate and stock speculators on board. On the 20th, we docked in San Francisco having been on the ocean for three months. We sailed the seven seas and called at 19 ports. We met some very pleasant people and had a wonderful trip. For eight of our passengers, the Malolo truly became their own little love boat. No less than four documented marriages resulted from romances created on board. Then, there was 19-year-old Jack Blanchard, traveling with his father from Grant Pass, Oregon. For father and son, this trip was truly a journey of a lifetime. For shortly after his 20th birthday, young Jack Blanchard succumbed to acute lymphatic leukemia. Our research for this story noted there were at least nine mysterious deaths shortly after the tour's end. Most died from natural causes, but records reveal one passenger died from pneumonia only days after she returned home. At least two deaths were tragically self-inflicted. It had been 90 days since the Malolo ventured through the Golden Gate her staterooms teeming with wealthy pilgrims searching for adventures in exotic worlds far from view. These were America's new Kubla Khans, and the Malolo their wandering Xanadu, a stately pleasure dome of magnificence and luxury reserved for those willing to pay the price. The millionaire's cruise was over, the twenties had lost its roar, the heat of the jazz age cooling while fortune slipped from their grasp and lifestyles became irreversibly transformed. The night before the Malolo returned home to San Francisco, Normandon penned a poem to his wife is still. Since we began our Pacific journey with the discovery of films taken by Louis O. Normandon, we believe it's only fitting to end it with his words as spoken by his great-grandchild, Paul Normandon. Yes, we have been traveling for exactly 90 days, seeing all the scenery that across the ocean lays. The poets have not talked enough about the tropic moon for it beckoned to us nightly in the harbor of Kowloon. Samoa, with its coloring and gorgeous scenery too, surely did entrance us as the tropics like to do. Then we came to old Hawaii, closer now to USA, and we felt a thrill of gladness when presented with a lay. Our visit was too short in that land of fruit and flowers, and the strain of their aloha lingered with us many hours.